We're going to move on to uh, the Q&A session now. Um, so I will invite Diane Morris, who is Rogerson's Chief Nursing Officer, um, to uh, pepper our, our speakers with questions. And I'll ask the speakers to share their, uh, share their videos uh, during the Q&A session, please. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we've had questions come in for each of the speakers today. Um, but I'm just going to piggyback on, on Richard's talk. We've, we've had two questions around patient engagement and they're not quite related, but I'm going to mash them together anyway. And the first question says, does Richard have any ideas for helping patients accept the need for masks during treatment and not being allowed to eat or drink during treatment? And is there, and, and there is an increased incidence in involuntary discharges related to anger and acting out related to these restrictions. And I'm gonna mash that with another question um, about telehealth. And um, from the patient perspective, is there a risk that telehealth is being overused at the provider's request rather than the patient's? Um, well, first of all, thank you for those questions. Both of them are very, very good questions. Let me, um, let me address the first one, first one first. Um, Eating is something that varies from facility to facility. And um, when I was on dialysis, I was, I was allowed to eat. Um, but then again, I wasn't eating a bag of potato chips, as, as some of my fellow patients did. And that was problematic. Um, I, I have to say that that's a call dependent upon the facility and dependent upon you know, what their rules and what their regulations are. With, with respect to masks, um, again, that's another that's another tough one. Um, I, I obviously I'm not on dialysis now where you have to where you have to wear the mask. But but the first question I would have is is how much space is there between between each station, and um, depending upon where you're located in the middle on the end, there there might be some flexibility. But you know what? There are some things as a as a patient, if the professionals are reasonable, I'm going to have to go with their call. You, you know, um, I'm, I'm the one to talk about patient engagement. We need to have a role. But, but again, if they say to me, you, you know, we're really trying to do this for your benefit. What happens if one person in here has COVID and they, and they spread it around? So uh, particularly, as you know, when you're on dialysis, you're going to be very vulnerable. So I, I certainly would have to defer to that. And what I might suggest is the type of mask that you're wearing. And and with respect to the, the other question about telehealth, you know, because of COVID, I think that there was an increase, deservedly so, in telehealth because you couldn't have that physical contact. Um, and again, a judgment call. Um, I think that many patients, including myself now, I would prefer to have that. But I think that as, as time goes by and you could go by and visit your doctor, and, and I'll be the first one to say this. I have all the respect in the world for doctors. When I don't get along with my doctor, I go get another one. So, I mean, if it's that much of an issue and, and you believe that it is being overused and you prefer, you know, a different type of contact, and I, I would certainly recommend that you, that, that you do that. I happen to serve on the committee where we review involuntary, in the, the involuntary discharges. And we do take a pretty deep dive on the reasons behind that. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty hard on, on the patients when, when, when something is not, when behavior is not there. But in many instances, I know, quite frankly, I was asking, how many of these are African-American males? I'm just very straight up about that. If I say something and you say something with the same tone of voice, it's going to be perceived very differently. And, and I take exception to that. And um, I've always spoken up about that. I've had that happen to me, and I've just laughed at it. And, um, and had to deal with it at the top level of the, um, of the facility. So I think that when involuntary discharges occur, they do go to the network and they do take a look at each and every single one of those and advocate really on behalf of everybody involved because in many of the facilities, um, quite frankly, the, the level of training of the techs, I'll just say that it varies. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, we have a question about nephrology nurse recruitment. Um, will the pandemic have a long-term effect on the recruitment of nurses and healthcare workers? What can we do to mitigate this? 
Or is there a way the pandemic made healthcare sexy and can be used as a recruitment tool? And we also have a question about um, can we recruit, how can we recruit nephrology nurses as, um, from, as new graduates? Thank you. So I think nephrology nursing is sexy. I just, so that's just me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of answers. Of, of course, um, COVID-19 has impacted um, education, period, across the board. And so, yes, I do see that um, affecting um, the recruitment of, of our nursing students. Um, into the nephrology practice. And however, what ANNA is trying to do right now and what we have already put into place, uh, we have a, like I said before, a new to nephrology nurses task force. And what we do is we offer actually free membership to our ANNA association. And uh, we also this past year have offered scholarships for these students to apply, uh, APRN, uh, RN, LPNs, uh, and nursing students to apply uh, to attend our symposium. And with that, if they uh, win the scholarship, actually we had four this past, we did our virtual, oh, a couple of weeks ago. We had four of those nursing students, uh, but we don't just leave them there. That comes with a mentorship. And so we have uh, members of the, the task force that are there uh, to mem mentor them throughout the year if they have questions or anything that they're able to, to call on those, on those mentors um, throughout uh, with, with any questions that they may have. And then we also uh, send um, representation from ANNA to the uh, National Student Nurses Association uh, conference, and they have a fall conference. I think it's coming up. And so we send our representation there. Um, to talk to the student nurses about becoming nephrology nursing and, and just all that it has to offer. Um, so those are two of the things, a couple of the things that, that we do right now. <laughs> I suspect Diane agrees with you regarding how sexy nephrology nursing is. One hundred percent, yes. Um, Dr. Lurie, we had a question. What do you mean by the bifurcated response in New York City? I think what I mean is that even though it's one New York City, um, that the, the public system, Health and Hospitals Corporation, its clinics, its hospitals, um, and the private hospitals all seem to function pretty independently when it comes to managing response and when it comes to particularly um, allocation of resources, dealing with surge capacity, doing those other things um, in a response. It's been a really chronic problem. They don't communicate well. They don't communicate well through the Emergency Operations Center uh, in New York City. I saw it in Hurricane Sandy. I saw it in Ebola, where one half of the system had resources and the other didn't. We saw it again when it came to dialysate over Easter weekend. One part of the system had resources, the other didn't. Um, I don't really understand why it's that way. It has seemed a little bit chronic and intractable, and I think it's going to take some uh, community level pressure to make that change. I, th I think that's absolutely right, because we certainly saw that during, during COVID as well, uh, that, that the Health and Hospitals Corporation went separately from the private organizations. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, it's pretty structural. It has something to do, not surprisingly, with the, and it, it's great that there's a public funded hospital and healthcare system in New York. And I don't want to take anything away from that for a millisecond. Um, however, when push comes to shove, you know, there's a natural tendency to allocate resources to the people you know, maybe to your friends, the people you work closely with all the time, those people who are part of the government system probably know how to yell and scream and advocate for what they need better. Um, but it results in pretty substantial inequalities. Looks like I'm getting some head nods there. Okay. <laughs> I think it's definitely true. <laughs> Thank you. Speed of speed. Yeah. Um, Todd, you brought up the nephrology subspecialties during your talk and hope we would talk about it on the panel. So would you like to talk a little bit about that? 
Um, sure. So at this point in time for nephrologists, you have essentially one accredited training program pathway. And I'm talking about adult nephrology here, although the, the parallel for pediatric nephrology is the same. So you have one pathway. Um, the requirements are exactly the same for every program. And it, it's essentially monolithic in the sense that it's, it's, it's all encompassing. You then sit for certification, again, as an adult nephrologist by the American Board of Internal Medicine. There's one exam, regardless of what you're interested in from a career perspective. And then when you sit 10 years later for recertification or maintenance of certification, it's the same blueprint for the exam. So essentially the same exam. But in that 10 year period, your, your career, you may focus say on dialysis versus interventional nephrology or um, transplantation versus um, more sort of what I'll call genetic diseases or general nephrology, et cetera. And when you look at most other specialties of the size of nephrology, both in terms of the, the sort of overview of intellectually what is expected from the nephrologist or just the number of nephrologists or the number of the patient population, there seems to be a subspecialization. And that seems to occur, again, using cardiology as a model at about the 50 year mark in the specialty. I think where this gets tricky is what, what's happening is there's a number of unofficial efforts to subspecialize nephrology. And so the best example is transplantation. So the American Society of Transplantation accredits a third year of training where after that third year, um, you're accredited as a, as a, as a transplant nephrologist. You're, you're, you've completed training as a, as a transplant nephrologist. There's no concomitant certification through the ABIM. I'm happy and, and I'm, I'm sure Nikki would love to have this conversation too around hepatology and what number you need in terms of people sitting to have an adequate a board or recertification exam, but that's probably a separate issue. But the point simply that this has had to go outside the system to work. Um, we've been engaging with the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, which is responsible for training, and with the American Board of Internal Medicine, which is responsible for certification and recertification about innovative models for training. And there are pathways. I think it's unlikely in the current environment that, that those will move anywhere past kind of the the, the pilot phase. And so what institutions are doing is they're saying, if you stay for a third year um, in nephrology, we'll focus on cardio renal. Or if you stay for a third year, you can be a nephro hospitalist or um, an onco nephrologist. So this is happening at a local level. And I think the question for an organization like ASN and for the broader community is, do we want to somehow systematize this and be more organized? And so again, there's essentially I guess four pathways, if I can try to do this from memory. One is the official process through the ACGME and the ABMI, ABMS, ultimately the ABIM, which is probably not gonna be successful for a whole set of reasons. A second is a more unofficial where groups like say AST says, we'll continue to focus on transplant, interventional nephrology, ASDN has their own sort of certification program, et cetera. That's a potential model. The third is this model where you do this kind of um, you know, you partner with another specialty, so critical care and nephrology or hospital medicine and nephrology. And then the final piece, which we don't talk much about, is the pathway that hospital medicine created over the last 20 years, which is initial training and certification is all the same, but at the 10-year point, when you recertify, you can have quote-unquote focus practice in a, a discipline like nephro-hospital medicine or renal cardiology or something like that. My point's only that there's a lot of different pathways here. And I think one of the things we know is that people would prefer at this moment in time to be expert in a, a, a certain area. And they'd like to align that with both the payment system, which is the other part of cardiology we don't talk about. And they want to align it with what the patient need is and where the patient is having the treatment. So if you wanted to have more home dialysis, you, you probably need to think about what that means from a training perspective, from a reimbursement perspective, and from how you certify and recertify physicians. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Todd. And I think you know, there's been a number of, of comments related to the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, uh, both particularly by Richard and, and Lillian. And the fact is that we don't have enough nephrologists trained in home dialysis. And there isn't really a very good remedy for that at this point, because there isn't a way to pay for additional training. So if we were to try to keep a fellow for a third year to train in home dialysis, we would have to fund that privately. 
um, which is very difficult for, for to do. So I agree with you that it's, it's a big issue, this issue of subspecialization. Um, and the other thing I was going to point out is that not only is the blueprint print in nephrology the same, but as a board certified internist and nephrologist, if I want to maintain my certification in internal medicine, I have to take the exam with the same blueprint in internal medicine that I took 30 years ago when I finished my internal medicine training. Yeah, the two things I'd add, just because they're interesting, one is that nephrologists have the highest rate of maintaining their, their, their certification in internal medicine and then recertifying in, in nephrology. So um, I don't know what that says about nephrologists, but it's just an interesting point. Um, I, I think the other thing is, is that nothing prevents the private sector from funding a third year of training. And so I'm happy to have a conversation around Medicare support for graduate medical education, but I think the point is, it's unlikely that the funding there is going to increase and there's going to be more new money coming to subspecialties or sub subspecialties. And so if we think that nephrology needs a third year, an optional third year to focus in expertise in dialysis, expertise in transplant, expertise in critical care, whatever, if we can agree as a community what those say four areas are or five areas are, I think we'd be better positioned to try to figure out a way for private funding. And then we would have to look at what are the entities out there that have a, a stake in terms of what the future of kidney care looks like and what this, you know, what the, you know, what's going to happen moving forward. I think that's our best, our best path forward. I will say if you, again, if you look at, you know, the residency positions and what's funded in residencies and fellowships has been capped since 1997 by the balanced budget act. However, there has been an increase. So individual hospitals have been paying out of pocket for this. So that is a possibility. And I know of at least one specialty society that's about to announce that they're going to pay for, that's how they want to expand as well. And so I do think you're going to see that moving forward. And there's a whole set of interesting public policy issues there. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more quick question, if, it, if it's going to be quick, really, for everybody on the panel. Um, there was an immense amount of stress in the dialysis facilities during the pandemic. And in providing the best quality of care to our patients, targeting our goals to reach the CMS benchmarks for the QUIP program and the star ratings did not become a priority. And what is the position of the panel on these quality related penalties during a pandemic? I don't know who wants to take the, the first shot at it. Richard, you were the one that, that brought up quality. So maybe, maybe if we want to take the first shot. Yeah, I, I think one thing's for certain is that um, during the pandemic, I do think that, that CMS has been, has been reasonable in terms of understanding and taking a look at, at exceptions. Um, I don't know um, that from a technical perspective, but, but certainly um, there are so many things that happened during this, um, during COVID-19 that was simply outside of the control. Um, and, and I take my hat off to the dialysis facilities because again, there's a lot of pressure on them to keep those patients safe. And, and, and I, I saw one director from CDC that indicated, well, the patient should not wait in the lobby. They should wait in their cars. And then when their appointment is scheduled, they should come in. I said, okay, that's a person who's never been to a dialysis facility <laughs> because when Metro Access drops you off, they might drop you off an hour and a half or two hours ahead of time and you go inside and wait. And it's those type of things. When, the, when somebody tells me they made a recommendation, but you've never been to a facility? No. So, so uh, again, um, I've worked with some of the other areas uh, um, where they've had to suspend some of the metrics during COVID-19. And then maybe some of the other panelists can, can, can add to that or give the correct answer, but, but that's, uh, I mean, we have to be reasonable during this time period and um, be flexible. Yeah. Nikki, what do you think from a government, oh, sorry, go ahead, Todd. Well, I, I was just gonna say, I, I think the other part of this, and, and, and Richard said it well, is that we do have to recognize that in this current situation, quote unquote, stronger teams or stronger entities perform better than weaker ones. And I think one of the advantages that our community has had is that CMS responded in a very direct and helpful way in, in several areas. And, and telehealth has been the one that's gotten the most mm -hmm. attention, but there are other ones as well. And I think we have to recognize that. 
At the same time, as, as Richard said, the dialysis facilities have also responded both individually by, if you will, company, nonprofit and for-profit, but then collectively, and in, 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 you know, Jeff's been really involved in terms of interacting with his counterparts, the other CMOs across the country. I, I think that that bodes well for the future in terms of, of, of the care in, in the arena. I think the challenge is, and it's, it's a really good question, and I don't have a great answer, is we do have to do what's best for the patient. And there are going to be times where in the short term, what's best for the patient is going to be a suspension of, of, of sort of, if you will, rules or how we think about things as long as we're still focused on the individual patient health and, and, and what's best for them. In the long term, though, we do have to look systemically across how we deliver care and what those, those metrics should be. And, and I think that's what's going to be interesting is as we look at the data after this year, are there going to be policy changes because we start to recalibrate what we think is reasonable and what we don't think is reasonable. And I, I just think, again, that only works with data, with a willingness to share the data and with an openness that, that none of us know going in what's going to work and what's not going to work. And if we're sensitive or come in with a predis, you know, predisposition as to what the answer is going to be, we're not going to be successful as a community. And ultimately, we're not going to do what's best for our patients. Thanks, Todd. Uh, Dr. Lurie, I see you uh, smiling and nodding there. Um, you know the government better than, than any of the rest of us. And so what do you think of their willingness to have the kind of conversation that Todd just outlined? I can't speak for, for CMS, but I was smiling and nodding because I so appreciate the perspective that we ought to let data guide policy when we can, and that we ought to do everything we can to learn from what's happened from this experience, what the data tells us in terms of what policy actions are needed or not needed, and move, um, move from there. It's very clear that CM, you know, a lot of these policies are there for lots of different reasons. A um, number of them are there to try to prevent bad or egregious behavior. Um, and when systems are under stress, sometimes those behaviors surface um, just because the systems are under stress. And as Todd said, you know, strong systems tend to do better. Sometimes they surface kinds of behaviors that people have wanted to execute for a long time but just haven't been able to because of, or haven't because of the regulations. And we've been having a lot of discussion about racism on this webinar. And, you know, um, I do not want to see us weaken the kinds of protections that really protect patients of all kinds uh, against egregious kinds of practices. All of that said, um, CMS has enormous flexibility when it comes to waiving quality metrics, when it comes to waiving quality standards, when it comes to enforcement discretion in a public health emergency. And it uses enforcement discretion of one kind or another in almost every kind of public health emergency. And so I think if there are policies that are really impeding on the ability to deliver the kind of quality patient care that you think you should be delivering or that patients are feeling are impeding the kinds of care that they need to have, they need to be in touch with CMS about it. Great, thank you. And, and Lillian, I think that reflects a little on, on some of what you do is on a daily basis in terms of, as Richard touched on before, the quality metrics that are important for individual patients vary quite a bit. In your work on a day-to-day -day basis, you, you provide different counsel to different patients depending on their individual needs. Can you sort of speak to how the, the quality programs impact the patients in that? Uh, I, I think absolutely. Uh, ANNA encourages just the use of the valid and reliable measures um, through uh, NQS, um, the endorsement, and those that's kind of the stance that we take. And we'd also like to see um, some of the, the nurse sensitive outcomes that you're talking about. Um, those those things that, that you may not see um, I, I don't know, I mentioned about the, the, the mental, when, when I talked about the mental health and the wellness, um, but just the time and the care um, that the nurses are, are there at the chair side in terms of, of also the family involvement and the education and the explanations and, and, and those things that um, 
affect their care quite a bit, and they directly relate to, to that social determinant of, 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 of health um, and, and what, we, what we're there to address. I don't know if that answers your question, but that directly affects um, those patient care outcomes. It both answers the question, but it, it brings me to another question that was brought up in the chat box, which is that each of you has talked some about socioeconomic determinants of health. How do we begin to address those issues and ensure that those considerations are, are being appropriately assessed as we look at the quality of care that we're all providing? Well, well, I'll take the first stab. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, but one thing's for certain, it is something that, you know, I had a friend who was a medical sociologist. I'm going back to the 70s. He was laughed at because he talked about a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with uh, um, um, poverty and things of that nature. Well, that's where we're at now. They've come full circle. And, um, you, you know, housing, um, lack of transportation and all of that, some of those things relate to, I mean, do people have jobs? Are they working? Do they have access to that? And you can't have access to health care, but if you can't get there, or you can't afford to go there, or you can't get off your job, or you lose your job, then that's certainly problematic. So I think it's something that will have to be well thought out and implemented in a very, I'm going to say from a macro basis. And it's, it, it certainly goes beyond the healthcare system as, as we know the healthcare system now. So I wouldn't put all the burden of solving that on the back of the healthcare system. So you're really talking about partnering with other communities and, and perhaps other elements of the government, if, I, if I'm understanding you right, Richard. Absolutely. So Nikki, do you think there's a forum for us to, to be able to, to do that in government, or is that something that the private sector really needs to lead? There should be a forum for it, without a doubt. You know, I started my career, the government part of my career, working for Dave Satcher and launching all of the health disparities work. Um, and at that time, there was clearly a forum for that in government. During my time with the Obama administration, the set of issues around disparities, the social determinants of health, the multifactorial approaches, um, very much were things that were um, central to my office because it's, um, you know, populations with different kinds of disadvantage, poor minority populations, whatever it is, that are always at the wrong end of the stick when it comes to being impacted by disasters. And so again, there was a place for that in federal government. I hope that we'll see a time soon when there is again a place for that in federal government. Great, thank you. You asked me not to be political, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, I could, if I could suggest if, if you know, we're talking at a macro level, I'll, I'll provide a specific micro example. So in most communities, the medical school and the major teaching hospital are the, if not the major employer, they're one of the top three employers. And I would challenge academic health system, uh, academic health centers to develop meaningful relationships with their local communities. So I'll use an example from Texas in, at Baylor. They have a relationship where they sponsor K through 12 education. They have programs, STEM plus medicine. Um, they then have high schools that they support, et cetera. That combines both education and a possibility of increasing the, the workforce and, and beyond physician workforce, just the healthcare workforce across the board and their interest in, in these issues. And if you start to have that kind of intervention, then you're looking at, at food um, you're looking at other sort of transportation, to Richard's point, housing, et cetera. So I, I think this has to be a combination. And, you know, I started my presentation with a quote from Vladimir Lenin. So I think we know where my politics are. Um, but I think this, <laughs> I think this has to be, a, that's for Richard. Um, uh, this has to be a combination of the federal government, and state and local governments really assessing what their values are and what it is that they think we should emphasize. But then at a local level, there has to be a much more of an intervention and a willingness to do things. That, and, and a lot of this is happening currently because of the, the, the pandemic and everything else happening in our country. So how do we build on that momentum locally, but then also prioritize at a federal level and then at a state level what we think is truly important? 
Yeah, no, I think you're spot on, Todd. And you know, one of the ways I've been advocating for a number of years, it's not popular with academic health centers, is they are the largest employer. It's pretty easy to put all of their employees on a map and look at the communities where their low wage workers live and are most disadvantaged. And it's a way that both supports uh, their workers, their populations, those low income communities, and also can provide really interesting opportunities for some of their workforce to become ambassadors to their communities in different ways and to provide intelligence about what life is like where they live back to the people in those fancy offices so that you can start to have a much different kind of conversation about the kinds of actions and activities that are possible. And I think that that's really a great point, especially as academic medical centers have sort of spread their tentacles into the communities and taken over a lot of community practices, they certainly have more opportunity to be able to reach out into those communities. Yeah, and I can't not make this comment. Um, I grew up in Rochester, New York. The largest employer in Rochester is the University of Rochester, and it's, it's a community that was built around Kodak and IBM and Xerox and Bosch and Lom and other factories none of those companies exist the way they did. And so the University of Rochester and the other universities have, I think, an obligation to the community to think about what their relationship is, the way a generation or two generations ago, those major companies were thinking about some of these issues. We can argue about sort of how that played out, but I think it's an important point. Totally. And you can I see think I around the country too, of where academic health centers have partnered with other large employers to try to do this kind of thing. Um, they don't have to go it alone, but the more of the parties you get into this, uh, the better off you are. And I think the faith-based communities um, should be mentioned here as well in, in terms of when you're talking about community, um, those physicians, they, they attend churches um, in, in those communities where they serve. And that is a, I know you don't mix, I don't want to mix politics with religion and, and that kind of thing. But um, that's, that's another big area or another big, um, what I want to say, community, just another big place where you can make a big difference um, in the community and get the education out there and, and, and get that trust, I think, um, that formation of trust going. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great point. As Todd talked about earlier, trust is in the government is really declining. And trust in religion is not. And so I think it's an area where there is trust. And if we can work with the faith-based community, I think it gives us an opportunity to rebuild some of that trust. That's an excellent point. And I would point, point to one of Todd's uh, earlier slides where he had the demographics up there. And a lot of times in terms of going into the communities, it's helpful if you have some people that look like the people that you're trying to deal with. Um, that's tough to do when you look at the numbers um, I know I'm, I'm working with Hopkins and I go into places in Baltimore probably. It's a great city now where um, some people might not feel comfortable going, but I want to go in because I tell you, the dialysis facilities tied to universities are very, very different than dialysis city, dialysis facilities in the inner city. And I won't mince words about that. Um, I visit some of them and when I can, I'll, I'll talk with some of the people there, but it's something that we have to deal with because they're the ones that are need most most of the help and um some of the facilities you know a dollar store on one side a liquor store on another side a fast food joint on you know in back of it it's um we can do better we can do better i, I think that's a great point as todd pointed out uh, our nephrology community um as far as as the caregivers do not look like our patient communities and i think that it's really important that those two align it also brings up an, another question that was asked, which is how can the nephrology community work more collaboratively with other disciplines such as endocrinology and cardiology to address chronic conditions such as screening for CKD, particularly in patients with diabetes and hypertension. And I think that the community outreach that we've all been touching on is an important part of that. I don't know if, if you know, Lillian, maybe you wanna comment on that. Again, that's, I know, an area where you've worked. Well, we already see this um, even at, at the VA. There is just that kind of relationship um, in terms of, of interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary um, care. 
And so the consults that we get from endocrinology, um, neurology even, um, they happen all the time. And um, I think it's, like you said, it's, it's a very important part. And the only way that we're going to be able to adequately address um, and capture um, those folks that, that need the help the most. Um, I've, I've run into many patients, um, their mother or their father may have been on dialysis and they don't want to hear anything about it. And they've never been spoken to from members of the family, like just within the family um, about that condition. And so that's very, that's interesting to me. Um, they would rather just avoid it or, or make like it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Um, but I do see that a lot at, at the VA. Um, we get those consults very, very early on, and that was very encouraging to me. That's great. And, and Richard, I think that really is, is very aligned with what you were saying before in terms of how patients feel when they have advanced kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease on dialysis. And I wonder if it's not some of what Lillian's describing happening earlier in the process as well. It, it is. Many patients, um, they feel like they're not okay. They don't want to talk about it. They, in fact, will hide it. To hide it from your employer. Of course, we know you can only do that for so long. Um, I've had patients after five years, they kind of had a coming out. Hey, I have this disease and I need to deal with it. And they just wouldn't talk to, to anyone about it. So we, we encourage support groups and things of that nature. So you can begin having a discussion at some point. So you can kind of get this burden off. Your when you hear somebody else who's worse off than you are, that really motivates you to, to kind of loosen up. And trust me, no matter how bad off you are, there's somebody in many cases who's worse off. Nephrology is a tough area. It's a tough profession. You guys must be a little bit smarter than the other docs. <laughs> and Todd, do you, in your role with the uh, Council of, Me of Medical Specialty Societies, do you see the opportunity for collaboration, say, with cardiologists and endocrinologists? I, I do. I mean, I think a, a platform like CMSS works best when it's all the specialties working together. But I think in terms of this specific question, and this is more my opinion than ASNs, although I think, you know, given some of the work over the last year, particularly what KDGO was doing related to lexicon and nephrology, we really probably made a mistake by coining the phrase chronic kidney disease and, and, and lumping everything under CKD and then having stages. And, and, and again, I think that's helpful in some ways, but if we are serious about these partnerships, and I think we are, these relationships, maybe thinking about kidney disease a little differently where there's a component that's related to cardiovascular disease and hypertension, and there's a natural partnership with cardiology in particular there. There's a component related to diabetes and sort of diabetic kidney disease, and there's a relationship with endocrinology. And then there's a whole set of genetic diseases, and I think there's a huge opportunity there in terms of as we think about testing and screening and identifying populations that are that are vulnerable based on family history and, and other sort of genetic factors. And I think there we might have a maybe an initial really good conversation with primary care. And if we start to approach it that way, I think we may have better discussions than if we try to again be monolithic as to how we think about the you know the, what is really a set of diseases. Um, so I, so that's sort of how I've been thinking about this at least. And I think increasingly you're seeing that in some of the definitional work. And, and Nikki, I know that you do primary care in an underserved community. Do you have a, a sense of how patients feel about kidney disease? You know, sadly, so many of my patients don't really understand that they have kidney disease until they go on dialysis. Um, and it's a really big education and communication challenge. And I'm stunned by the number of patients I see um, in our setting who have chronic kidney disease, who are on a path, who've got family members who are on dialysis. It's, they know a ton about it. And um, some combination of understanding and denial um, and the fact that, frankly, they've got other pressing day-to-day -day life needs um, that get in the way of their addressing this um, just continues to be a really, really huge challenge. Yeah, thank you. 
Lillian, there are a couple of questions about attracting current nurses to nephrology. So there was one question about hospital coworkers interested in moving to dialysis, but because uh, moving to dialysis requires a year of experience in acute dialysis, they think that that's a barrier to, to bringing nurses into dialysis. Um, and then there was another question about how do we encourage more nephrology nurses to train in home therapies? Wow, so that is uh, very timely and something that uh, ANNA is actually talking about a lot. Um, there was a couple of messages posted on open forum bet between our members, amongst our members, and there were suggestions that um, the med surge actually uh, set up a kind of a internship, if you will, within the hospital that would allow those nurses um, who will work on either the renal floor or the med surge floor to uh, be part of this internship. Um, and again, I talked about flipping the script. Um, we generally ask our new nurses that are, are new to the profession to train in the chronic dialysis uh, units. And I think a model might be where, where we're now allowing them to actually to get that training um, acutely. And I think that will not only attract um, and make it more sexy, I think, to the, to the younger uh, nurses that are coming out, but I think it would really give them um, a, more, a broader sense of the complexities and, and really um, what's really involved in, in nephrology nursing. Um, the year um, of experience in, in terms of, of uh, being able to, to go into the home hemodialysis, I think it's, it's warranted. There are many, many situations that nephrology nurses um, um, might not experience um, right away and, and many, many nuances um, to that. And so I think with the year um, under their belt, it, it, would, it would serve them well. So I agree with that. Um, and I, I don't see it as a barrier. I see it as, as a foundational piece that, that would make them, um, I think, more effective in, in the home hemodialysis arena. You know, and, and I think that touches on two important thoughts. The first is I, I think that it would certainly make patients more comfortable knowing that the nurses that are caring for them and training them have more experience. But it also makes me think about what Todd was talking about earlier in terms of I wonder if there's not a way to partner with industry to build some sort of stipend that might make it more attractive for some of the nephrology nurses to train, for example, in home dialysis. I agree with that. <laughs> that would be my comment. Yes, certainly, certainly. And we're also, we, were, we thought about um, uh, just with the nursing workforce in, in general, um, just the student loan forgiveness and, and, and so on, those types of things um, also have to be considered. Yeah. yeah. If I could just on that point, just to circle back to something when you're asking sort of concrete answers around social determinants of health and ways to diversify the workforce. I mean, really thinking creatively about loan forgiveness programs for nurses, physicians, other health professionals, I think is something Again, this is a broader responsibility than nephrology, but I think it's a conversation we need to have because um, we have to do everything we can to incentivize people to pursue careers in healthcare um, and then to subspecialize in these areas. I agree. I think it's a good idea. That's an idea. Well, all we need is a task force to, to get the process started. <laughs> Um, Todd, there's a, a question here that I, I think will uh, really go right to uh, something you want to talk about, which is uh, the artificial kidney program. When do you anticipate its launch and, and what should people look out for? Um, so the goal is um, this will be um, Kidney X, which again is a partnership between a ASN and the, and the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, our plan is to um, and it's part of the overall, so we'll be releasing the prize announcement probably before the end of October. Um, let me just say before election day, 
um, so that I give myself a little bit of wiggle room, but, but soon. And, um, you know, it will be a, a $10 million prize. Um, and it's a combination of public and private funding. Thank you, Todd. So we're just about at the top of the hour. Um, I want to give, uh, first, I want to thank each, each of our speakers for their time today, for their dedication uh, all year long, and especially during the, the crisis of the past six months. Um, but I'd like to give each of our speakers a, a chance for about a minute of a, of a closing thought. Um, so maybe we'll go in reverse order of, of where people spoke. So Richard, why don't you start us off? Yeah, again, um, I'm going to speak directly to the patients. Um, positive mental attitude. There is reason to have much hope. A lot of innovation. And despite this um, challenge being caused by COVID-19, um, all the speakers here are talking in areas where there's tremendous um, innovation occurring. And we need you. We need you to join us to have your voice heard so that we can talk to those um, illustrious individuals who are in elected positions that make these types of decisions. So um, I'm going to encourage you to stay engaged, work with Rogerson. You've got a great outfit up there and um, join us and uh, become more engaged. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I'll come back to Lillian and Todd in a moment. Nikki, I know you have to go. So if you want to make a, a closing comment. Sure. Well, first, thanks for inviting me to be part of this great panel and discussion. I've learned a lot and it's been um, really terrific. I think I'll close with, um, you know, the thought that I left you with before. Never get a good, let a good crisis go to waste. Please try to envision the future that you want. What is the future that we want for our, our patients? We're hearing a lot about innovation. What is it that we want innovation to bring us in the future? And how, as it brings us innovation, how are we sure that the benefits of that innovation are equitably shared? How is it that we want to have a healthcare workforce of the future? How does it reflect our society? How does it look like our patients? How do we take care of our healthcare workforce, right? Many things we've talked about today about how is our society put together and what do we want that to look like um, in the future? And how do we make it so that at the end of the next public health emergency and public health crisis, uh, people who are low income, minority, chronically ill, all of those things don't once again get the short end of the stick. And then finally, how do we restore the functioning of our government um, so that people will have faith in it and so that we can, frankly, end this COVID pandemic when we have a safe and effective vaccine that people will want and will take and will protect them. Thanks, Thanks very much. Todd? Closing comments? Um, well, thanks. And, and also to, to thank you and, and everyone at, at Rogerson for the invitation, but also the help and, and, um, and the assistance with the, the video conference, which I know is, is no small undertaking. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll make the, I'll, I'll summarize where I ended in terms of the presentation, which is, you know, AKP has dubbed this the decade of the kidney. Um, I think we should embrace that and, and as a community work together to make that a reality and really point to what we think the specialty should look like um, by the end of the decade, by 2030, and to really um, take advantage of this opportunity that the federal government has shifted its focus to emphasizing kidney health and, and all the aspects there. Um, but this is an inflection point. You know, 2020 is going to be an opportunity and we do need to use the accelerant that exists to really move ourselves forward as quickly as possible to take advantage of these opportunities. And we have an opportunity to really shape that future. So let's not, let's not lose this, this moment in time. Um, I do think everything's aligned better than it's ever been aligned um, in the kidney community broadly defined. And we have to be willing to, it's sort of the Stockdale paradox in terms of um, understanding the brutal facts and the reality but also not losing faith as to what the future can be and sort of holding both those ideas in our heads and really to, to be hopeful and to do everything we can um, in 2020, 2021 and beyond um, to take advantage of this opportunity to work together um, to leverage things like the Artificial Kidney Prize or um, opportunities related to training for home dialysis or this new focus on health disparities and social determinants of health. We're just uniquely positioned in a way that as a specialty we never have been before and, and let's do everything we can to be successful 
you know, not only for our patients, but for the broader society. Thanks, Todd. Lillian, we'll turn it to you to wrap us up. Okay, and I would just say, um, I echo uh, what all of the speakers have said, and I would just like to just take a couple of words from one of our prior um, present presenters at our symposium, and I think leadership, too, um, is going to be the key. And we are the leaders, um, and we need to lead with transparency, the communication, um, and the support. It takes a village, and I think we're able, and I'm hopeful, very hopeful, um, that we're able to, to lead nephrology into this era of tomorrow. Thanks very much. Uh, we're now going to share the uh, continuing education codes um, and evaluation forms uh, information. Um, and I just want to, as we close, thank all of the speakers for their leadership and their dedication uh, and for their time here today. I think it was a great conference. I personally learned a lot and I appreciate everything that, that you've all done and that our team back at the shop, uh, both the development team and the IT team have done to, to put on this conference. So thank you all again, and uh, I appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you. Thanks.